uh, to, to interact with because we have a lot of resources linked to that PDF. So you want to make sure. Uh, I see sometimes people uh, before the conference were trying to like convert it into Word or, or what is it, a, a Google Doc or something, but then it loses all those links. So you want to make sure you, you view it and, and save it um, as, a, as, a, as a PDF. So if, if once you have that, um, when you get your PDF, the second page of your PDF is uh, looks like this, and you could tell there's something linked to your PDF uh, because there's a little hand there. <laughs> so if you're if you're interested, you can uh, obviously take notes as however you want, or just sit back, close your eyes, and like take it in, or <laughs> whatever you want to do. But we offered, uh, my colleague suggested that we, we, people talked about, oh, it's nice to have your own note taking. So if you click here, it'll prompt you to copy, uh, make a copy of, uh, of a handout. So we have a little template here that has our email um, and then just the main heading. So if you want to take notes, you know, you could just save it. And then we also have at the bottom uh, linked some of the resources that we're, we're talking about. So if, you're, if you'd like to do that, you're welcome to do that, but uh, you can do whatever you want, whatever um, gives you access. So. so that's just the second page of your PDF. So I think we're, we, yeah. oh, we have just one more minute, so it gives you a chance, uh, but welcome. Oh, yes, sorry. This is a, a PC, right? So I'm, yeah. I'm just like, I'm feeling. No, right. <laughs> yeah. no, I, don't, I, don't, I was just looking, I have a Mac at home, and so then I go back. Oh, that's so good. But it's good for it's our brains. Brain. Yeah, yeah. Good for our brains. <laughs> 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 I feel the same way. Anything that's like, sometimes people Anything will say. Anything that's different. It's good, yeah. <laughs> I don't feel that way when I can't find what I need. Yeah. 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 You know, or clicking on something, and it works at home, and it doesn't work on the oh, yeah. PC. Yeah, you, you go. Oh, you want me to do something? Well, because we're already... Okay, cool, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Oh, she wanted to go back. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So for those of you that just walked in, you can scan the QR code or you can go to the link here and you'll get a copy of the, the handouts and some of the resources and our slides. It'll all be also be available on Crowd Compass. What a great turnout. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming and sticking in here with us. I know it's day three of the conference, and I'm sure your brains are on overload by now. Um, but I appreciate that you are, you are all here with us today. I want to uh, go ahead and introduce the panelists and our presenters today. My name is Adelicia Brienzo. Uh, my pronouns are she, her hers, and I am with the Illinois Resource Center. I'm the newest uh, education specialist. And then we also have today with us um, Lydia Cavinta. She is from ISBE. She's one of the principal consultants. She will also be here to answer any questions you have. And then we do have two amazing ladies from Schaumburg District 54 with us, and they will be doing a good part of the presentation to talk about their experiences in their own districts. And that is Dr. Elizabeth Perez. And she is a bilingual school psychologist in District 54, as well as Nancy Hellstrom. She is an instructional coach in School District 54 in Schaumburg. And then we also have Christina Sanchez Lopez with us today. She is uh, an education specialist from the Illinois Resource Center. Uh, we're going to move on. Does any, did you want to uh, kind of talk a little bit about your experiences in, in the district? So um, as was said, I am uh, Elizabeth Perez. I'm a bilingual school psychologist. I've been a bilingual school psychologist for many, many years. Uh, prior to that, I was a TBE and TPI teacher, so I have both perspective and both lenses, and I know the importance of um, collaborative efforts. I've been in 54, and I've seen the evolution that we've done. So what we're going to be sharing in, um, is just our, our perspective from 54. So welcome, and thank you for coming. I am Nancy Hellstrom, and I'm an instructional coach for the Department of Language and Culture in District 54. Um, 
Like Liz, I've also served as a TBE, TBI teacher in the district as well as in other districts. Um, worked as a bilingual teacher in other districts as well as worked with adults with ESL. In my role, I um, have wear many different hats, I'm sure like many of you. I oversee our uh, EL Assessment Center that we have in, in the district as well as work collaboratively with teams um, like Dr. Perez and uh, classroom teachers, special ed teachers, um, when questions come up about the progress that um, bilingual learners are or are not making. So looking forward to sharing our experience with you today. Good morning, I'm Lydia Quinta. I am a principal consultant with the multilingual department of the Illinois State Board of Education. And my role is mostly to ensure compliance, but we also provide technical assistance to districts. And as far as my background, it's applied linguistics uh, from Europe um, and multi-language uh, personal history, I would say. And I'm also LBS1 uh, with uh, experience in teaching special education. Thank you, everybody. And uh, our next uh, slide is just to kind of give you an idea of what today's, um, what can, you can kind of expect from today's session. We realize that you have a lot of questions and this is a big topic and it's a lot to cover. So we're gonna be kind of moving a little bit quickly. We hope to get to a lot of your questions and to be able to address some of your concerns. Um, but again, this, this could be a conference in itself, right? Um, so we're gonna do a presentation first and um, uh, Dr. Perez and uh, Ms. Hallstrom are going to uh, talk again about their experiences in Schaumburg District 54 and what's worked for them. Then we will have a bit of a panel discussion and we hope that we have addressed um, some of the questions that you had um, submitted previously. And then we will be sharing some frequently asked questions and some resources for you to look into at a later time. Again, thank you for joining us and, and again, just a as we welcome all of you and share our experience again, this is, um, we just wanna share what has worked for us in District 54, kind of the path that we've been on um, during the last 10 years or so um, and working collaboratively and seeing the benefits of, of that collaboration. And so during our time, we're going to just briefly share with you some of the benefits that we've experienced as a team, uh, taking a collaborative approach. Also, uh, how that collaborative approach has helped ensure that our students are receiving the support that they need, um, what collaboration looks like during the IEP process, and then what that looks like when we are um, coming up with what, how we're going to provide the services for our duly identified students. So one thing that um, when we think about um, identifying the referral, the eligibility and evaluation process for uh, bilingual learners, Often when it, what comes up in a disconnect is that we often think about it that it is primarily the responsibility of the special education department. So I just want you to think about that and that perhaps there is, as we've discovered, a different way to look at it um, as this video illustrates.
reason that we chose that video is that when we think about the referral and the identification process and all that is involved when we're looking at students who are bilingual learners and who may also have a disability, it can seem like a daunting task. It can seem very overwhelming. And when we think about it just in fitting um, in the responsibility roles of one department, like the special ed department, again, it's, it's very overwhelming and can be daunting. But when we come, we've discovered that when we come together and we collaborate, that then we are actually able to uh, make progress and move forward in how we not only identify students, but how we support those students. And these are just some of the benefits that we've seen in our district um, as a result of the collaboration that's occurring between our special ed department and our Department of Language and Culture, and really with our general education uh, classrooms as well. That there is that sense of shared responsibility. That when we look at students, that they are the responsibility of everyone in the district and not just one singular department. Uh, then our staff has an increased uh, feeling of being supported throughout that process. They are more comfortable in asking questions and asking those questions early on. Um, in previous years, uh, before this collaboration was really uh, part of the practice, uh, we would often, as in the Department of Language and Culture, find out that an, a bilingual learner had been identified or was about to uh, have an IEP after that had already gone through that process. And so then that opportunity for having that discussion and looking at the student from different lenses was no longer there. And so now those questions are being asked earlier on and, and everyone is coming to the table much sooner than before. Um, there's then that increased willingness to really start that MTSS process of really looking at a student very early on and, and having those conversations right away when we're starting to uh, notice some concerns for a student. And then also shifting the focus of our teams from not just thinking about that immediate need of like, what am I going to do for this student right now? But thinking about the long-term implications of decisions that are being made for students and what our long-term goals are for those students. As I mentioned, the value of having multiple viewpoints so that we're hearing the special ed viewpoint as well as the multilingual viewpoint as well as the general education classroom teacher's viewpoint. Those multiple viewpoints just provide uh, more depth and understanding who the student is and what their needs are. And then also involving more, bringing more experts to the table, right? Hearing again the different viewpoints and what they have to offer, learning from each other. And really overall having an understanding, increased understanding for classroom teachers, everyone who's involved, that what we might think the outcome is going to be, it may turn out to be very different from what we originally anticipated. Just to have a, um, technical Sorry. difficulties. So basically, just to have a, an even playing field, MTSS, um, because different districts call it differently, but the b basic underlying principle is it's a framework, right? And it's both on the academic as well as the behavioral side. It's very critical that we have this framework because on both sides, um, because then it gives us a process. It starts the process. And so that idea that everybody receives the universal systems at tier one, and then there's a tier two, um, it's a smaller group instruction. And it's much more focused on um, area of need. And then there's that tier three, and that's individualized um, focus on the child, again, either behaviorally or academically. So that's really what this um, slide is uh, trying to impress upon you. And so going on a little bit, um, these are important questions that we need to have walking in with any at-risk student. So Nancy and I and the, and the conversations that we've had with the, the panel here have had this conversation in regards to these are critical questions, years of schooling. For our EL or multi, uh, multilingual students, what age did they enter into the English system, right? What is their socioeconomic status? I would add to that, 
where, where are they coming from? Because a student who comes from Mexico is different from a student who comes from Venezuela, is different from a student who comes from Honduras. And those are really critical differences that we need to be aware of, right? Um, and it's different from a, a student who comes from Nigeria. So we need to have an understanding of that to the best of our ability. Our, their immigrant status, what are they working with, right? Um, <clears throat> level of parents' education, that is also critical. Again, for those, that's a critical Thing that we need to have an understanding for any at-risk student, but particularly for our EL, our multilingual students. Um, what is their exposure to school expectations, right? What we expect from a student um, might be different in their home country, and we need to have an understanding of that, those differences. Um, raising our hand, yell, not yelling out, um, eye contact, all those are nuances that are very critical in development of, um, of our child. And this idea of sequential versus simultaneous bilingualism, you know, did the child have a solid foundation in L1, right? And if they do have that solid foundation, so you have rich environmental um, experiences coming from um, a home where there's rich, authentic um, examples and models, They've started, they've been exposed, or is that a simultaneous learner? Myself, I'm a simultaneous learner, so there was both languages. Although we use one more than the other, there was both in my home because I'm the youngest of four children. And that is critical to have the understanding if I was not a sequential learner, so I don't have that found solid foundation as my sequential learner by uh, EL multilingual students do. I am much more of a simultaneous learner, and so understanding that those differences is critical for a child's learning. So often when we start the MTSS process, I don't know about you, if you've been part of that process, a question that often comes up is, is it language or is it special ed, right? And that the way that we're wired as human beings, we often want to just put uh, students into a box. We want to know which box do they fit into. And this collaborative process really helps all of us understand that the pro it's really more gray than we want to admit to ourselves and that it's not necessarily one or the other. And so as we're talking with our staff, working through the, the MTS process, one thing that we talk about is that, uh, because there would be this mindset that we could not look at a multilingual student and consider them for eligibility until they met prof proficiency and were quote unquote no longer EL. However, we all know that uh, whether you are a multilingual individual yourself or from working with students, that that's always part of who we are, right? That as a language learner, if, as I am a language learner of another language of Spanish, I'm continuing to grow throughout until I take my last breath, I'm continuing to grow as a language learner. And so we can't just say, oh, that's done. That, that student is no longer a language learner. That student is no longer going through that process of continuing to grow in their language. And so what we really know is that we have to look at uh, what IDEA stated in 2004 and knowing and accepting and recognizing that language and culture are always part of serving multilingual students. But under this uh, reauthorized IDEA Act of 2004, that as a team we really want to document the extent to which these are part of the presenting problem and identify that they're not the most significant determining factor. And so something that we've shared with our teams is this idea of a, of a scale, of a balance. Uh, this was created by Dr. Sharon Vaughn, where we're really identifying what we know as we're um, talking about the seven factors that you may be familiar with, um, by Barb Mar uh, Mahler that talks, looks at all the different factors that Liz was talking about as well, and really um, looking at how much they're impacting what we're seeing with the student. So for example, if it's a language difference, it might be something that's just the result of that normal process of second language acquisition and its impact on that development. Versus if it is a language disorder, we know that it's characterized by deficits in language comprehension or production in both the first or native language as well as the second language. So really pulling apart the information and the data that we're seeing with students. So for example, if we have a student where their literacy knowledge and skills in the first language are adequate, but the, second, uh, the skills in the second language are low, 
versus a student who's low literacy in both languages, but we know, as Liz was saying, that they've only been here for a short period of time. They haven't really received that adequate instruction in either language. That's a different scenario than a student who has low literacy skills in both languages after receiving adequate instruction. And that last part of that adequate instruction is such, we have discovered is such a crucial part of that conversation. What does instruction look like for those students? And so as we go through and we talk through this process collaboratively as a team and getting all of this input from different members of the teams, we're able to say that, you know what, if it's low literacy in the second language but they're strong in the first language, it's really probably a matter of instruction. Let's go back and look at the instruction that's going on for this student. Similarly, if they're low in both languages but they have not received that adequate instruction, maybe they're a student who's interrupted schooling, um, then we wanted to, again, go back and look at instruction. But if we, after looking at all of the information that we have, identify that that student has low skills in both languages after receiving the adequate instruction, that's when we're then going to move on forward with our problem-solving process, or the MTSS. And so as we go into that MTS process, again, that goal is really, we're asking the same question, but from different lenses. And our goal is really to be able to answer these two questions primarily. What are the student's strengths? That's our first, our most important question. What can the student do? Right? As often what we see is what, um, what the deficit, but we really want to think about the strengths of the student first, and then what are those areas for growth? And so we want to look at it from multiple lenses, the lens of the general education classroom teacher, the English language or dual bilingual support, as well as then from special education. And because our common goal for all of us, really with the student being at the center of everything, is we want to, to the best of our ability, to try to identify the why. Why is growth not happening the way that we think that it ought to? Since we do have that common goal, right? What is our ultimate goal? We want the child to be successful. We have that common goal. We want to know what the student's strengths. So as a bilingual school psychologist, Typically, when I've consulted with teams, whether it's in the teams that I'm working with and or a team that I, in my district, um, that is one of the first, this first question is one of the first things I ask. What can they do, right? Because the, the child can do something. We just have to, you know, vocalize that. And then what are the areas of growth? So this graphic that you see, it does say can do um, descriptors, but this is just a way that our school district and our bilingual, EL multilingual teachers put together for a grade level. So where does, um, with respect to their listening, speaking, reading, and writing, where does the third grade EL multilingual students fall? That's it, that's all they're doing. They're bringing this to what we call the problem solving um, conversation. So this is just one grade level, in this case it was third grade, and where their, their students fell in this particular school year. But it's critical. This is where the collaboration comes into play because you do need those, those um, EL multilingual uh, professionals as well as um, the gen ed teachers to have an understanding of language acquisition. Is this doing, knowing their background, do you, are they where they should be with the years of being in the school, with the years of schooling? Now, Bearing in mind, have they been, for example, one of the questions I always ask is, have they been in 54? How long have they been? Because if they came from a different district, even if it's in Illinois, there is a difference in programming. And we need to understand that. Not that there's anything right or wrong, I'm just saying there's a difference. So the way District 54 does things may not be exactly the way another district does. So having an understanding of that. And then need the, you need to know, um, teachers need to know how students learn and how do they demonstrate that? So this information just here gives us a, a general idea. How are they going to be able to demonstrate their reading, reading ability and writing ability? And then what, what can we do to um, establish some rigorous goals for those students? So along with the guiding questions, we also have these other additional questions. And so this is critical, right? These are questions that um, we've gotten comfortable in our problem solving conversations as teams, whether it's at the building level or if I've come in and consulted they know that I'm gonna ask some, some, an array of these questions. So, so where is the growth dropping off and why? I'm always gonna ask you why. What is your hypothesis? What is your, what is your thinking? What scaffolds? I call it scaffolds. What have we done 
or what we've put in place for this child. Um, they get core, okay? What, we all know in our district what core is. They get acceleration, okay? We have a general idea what acceleration. What else have you put in place? Well, they see the bilingual teacher, how often, you know? And then there's this understanding of gen ed versus bilingual because both individuals at this point should be having contact with the child. Not just the bilingual EL teacher, but also the gen ed teacher has to have an understanding of their ability. And so that's where the collaboration, because I see this, you see this, where, where are we seeing the fallout, right? How are we measuring their impact? Exit slips, running records, um, common assessments, adaptations that we're doing, are we giving them something, visuals, anchor charts, those are just things that, you know, to have an understanding and how are they doing with those things. What does this assessment look like? Are they taking the common assessment at the grade level? And is there a modification? What is the adjustment? Why? Have you tried giving them the non-modified? Those are just questions. What other information would be beneficial to know? So once we get to a problem solving, what I tell um, teams is you've already started talking about this student. There is conversations, what else should we know? Well, it's a single family home, or they just came from X country. So those are important pieces of information that we wanna have when we're, we're talking about a child. How does growth compare to their peers? And here's where teams sometimes could get tripped up because our comparative data is not just grade appropriate data. Yes, we need to know if you're a third grader and the expectation is that you're meeting standard this way as a third grade, yes, I need to know that, but then add to that. My comparative data is comparing students who are also EL. And I always tell teams it does not, uh, obviously it would be beneficial if it's a Spanish speaking, another Spanish speaking EL student, but EL, multilingual, is multilingual. So if you have a student at the grade level who speaks a different language but they're multilingual, we want to have some information about both students. Why? Because you want to have some comparative data. How is their growth? What is happening, right? And I'll get into that in a little bit. If the student goes through the referral process and, and uh, referral and identification, how has their day changed? What are we doing? Why are we doing? It's very critical that there's always a goal in mind and why, right? Ultimate goal is to have them make grade level expectations, but how are we gonna get there and what are we gonna do? So going back to this graphic, I uh, was con consulting with this team. Again, this is third grade, and they really wanted to talk about Miriam. Miriam, knowing Miriam, some of the background knowledge, just to give you, um, had just came in as a newcomer to our district as a second grader. Okay, so you can see Miriam in speaking was a level two, okay? So that's critical to know. Newcomer in second grade, now a third grader, and she um, in third grade is a level two, according to Access. You can see that she's also in reading about a level three, probably a lower level, level three, but she's, she's making nice growth in one year of being a newcomer. The other student that is circled here is Santiago. Santiago has been in the district since, distri uh, since kindergarten. Okay, so he has been in the same school, in the same district since kindergarten. And if you note, yes, Santiago for speaking is at a level four, but Santiago in reading is still at a level two, and why? So those are questions we ask. And this, I'm gonna say simple, but it's not simple to put together. This graphic can show you that really quickly, right? And the great thing about what Liz was just sharing is that during this conversation with the teams, as they're talking about Miriam and sharing more information and, and uh, when you're comparing them to a like student or someone similar, that's how then Santiago comes up in the discussion. And so then Liz's um, focus really shifts and the team's focus shifts, maybe not so much about Miriam, let's talk more about Santiago and what can we do to support Santiago. So this is something, um, Similar to what Liz was just sharing, and when I'm meeting with teams, this is often something that I will do in my role, as I will plot out a student's growth on access over time. Now, th so this is a different student, but you can see that this student came in in first grade with the overall proficiency of a 2.3. There's the scale score, the student took a tier A test. Um, and then you can see where they fell in the different domains, right? In listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And then as you watch their growth over time, you see second grade, third grade, fourth grade. And around third grade is when they started to um, notice things with the student as they're looking at map growth as well. 
right? So we, we take MAP three times a year in our district, so they're looking at that data, the spring and fall data, to see that not only, that that's why we're starting to have concerns. We're not seeing growth overall for the students. So we're looking at the academic growth as well as the linguistic growth. And then looking, f what, um, what I highlight for teams then too is when we look at this growth and we think about how language develops, is there anything that's standing out that's a red flag? And for this particular student, you can see when you look at the data over time that listening proficiency is not developing as we would normally expect it to. When we think again about how language develops and which of the domains develop first and, and more rapidly than the others is often listening. And so when we see a student who's been with us again since first grade and now in fourth grade is still hovering around that level three in proficiency in listening, that's something that raises a question. And so then we're going to dig a little bit deeper and talk in a team about why we think that may not be happening or what factors might be impacting that. So again, this is just another tool that we, that we use. another caveat as to why it's important to have your multilingual or EL representative there because they have an understanding of that earlier um, screen that we just saw, right? They have an understanding of, yeah, this is not typical for a student, right? And so they can bring that to the table right away. So this next is just information, again, another student, this was a second grade, a second grade student that I was brought into a different building to collaborate and consult with. And they really, really were concerned about this student in blue, right? So their access score at the time, composite overall, was 2.8. Their FMP, because this is something we do in our district, uh, level was a level I. Um, average reading for information uh, was a two. Four, uh, three is meeting, so they're not meeting, right? Average for reading for literature, again, a two. Three is meeting. And then just to give a basic understanding of how they're doing with respect to math. And so this is information that they presented. And they know that Liz is gonna come in and Liz is gonna ask for comparative data. So they already had this prepared for me. And I, I more than happily would talk to them about student uh, 2.8, not a problem. This is, this is something, but at this conversation, what I did is say, what's going on with student three? Right, 2.6, H, one, one. 65. What's going on with this student? Now you would say 2.6 is not a 2.8, but this is where you get into that comparative data. It's close enough, right? You do not want to compare a 2.6 with a 3.6. That's a huge difference of expectation, but a 2.6 and a 2.8 are close enough to be able to start talking about what is going on. They're in the same grade level. They speak the same language and they've been, in, these are questions that I, I know now having had this conversation with them. They're in the same grade level. They speak the same language and they've been in the same um, uh, school and received the same schooling since the same uh, initiation, which was the beginning of kindergarten, right? So this is critical because what, why is this student doing? And so then we ended up having conversations about the student they asked me to consult with, the 2.8, as well as that student 2.6. And what ended up happening is that student 2.6 did go further in the process. We realized very quickly once we put certain supports in place, and that's where the collaboration comes in. The bilingual EL teacher said, well, we can do this. And um, the um, intervention coach came in and talked about this. And they were able to put some things place in place for both students. And student 2.8 was able to show growth. They weren't at grade level, but they definitely showed growth, uh, unlike student 2.6, who was making steadily growth, but not what you expect for what they were receiving. So that's critical for this conversation, right? Welcome, sir. <laughs> so the more, person, the more personnel that, that know about the development of oral language, contextual considerations, and the cultural backgrounds of a student, um, the better informed you're gonna make the right decision. That's kind of one of the reasons why we decided to say working and being comfortable with the gray, because it is gray. Student A is not gonna be stu like student B in any, whether you're multilingual or not, you are going to be different. And so there is a lot of gray. There's no black and white answer that we're gonna be able to offer you, but these are just pieces that are, we found success. And so really having a really good understanding and having all your stakeholders there, your gen ed teacher, this is where they need to be at the end of third grade. Your EL, this is where they should be with respect to their, um, to their language proficiency. 
And then if you're bringing them to the problem solving, your SPED person, okay, well, when I have a student who has these types of struggles, this is what we do and this is the growth that we typically see and this is how we would do it. As well as any other stakeholders, interventionists bring in a lot of things too. So we need to have that collaboration, but we have to have an understanding of background and all those questions that we had earlier. So this is a really important um, quote that we felt that put the need. So in the IEP meetings, these have, all of these stakeholders have to be represented. Obviously, you're going to have your special ed staff, whether that is um, a school psychologist, the speech language pathologist, the people from motor, right, PTOT, all of those people. You are obviously going to have the family representative, but the family are just hearing. And oftentimes, we also have to remember that when we are talking, let me pause here. Even prior to this, a family needs to be involved. So when you are putting things in place for a child and you are com having a conversation, let's say parent-teacher conferences, our district is right now going into parent-teacher conferences tomorrow. And I'm telling my teams, and I'm constantly reminding them, when we talk about where their child is, we need to make it very clear. We're not trying to say their child is in inept or unable, but we want them to have an understanding. So they should be reading a level M and they're reading a level H. Okay, well that doesn't have meaning. So there should be reading level M, that's a third grade level, and they're reading the level H. That's about first grade level. I have to always look at my reference, so I'm, I'm guessing at those levels right now. But you have an understanding. When you hear as a parent, third grade level should be this at this point, and they're reading at this level, you have an understanding so that when you get to the IEP meeting, it's not all new information. They've heard some of this before, right? They've heard what's been going on with their child, hopefully. Um, because we have had situations with that wasn't necessarily always tr as transparent as we would like. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, but also we're, um, represented in that um, meeting has to be an EL staff member. Uh, it is critical uh, for a lot of reasons. The special ed teacher um, evaluators are coming into that process at a different level than the gen ed teacher and, and, and the EL resource teacher. They have knowledge of student um, since day one. And perhaps with the, in the case of the EL staff, they've had several years, years of knowledge, right? Because they've worked with that child and, and those kids for a few years. So they have understanding of where they were and where, they have, or where they've gotten. The gen ed teacher has an understanding of where they started day one until the date of the IEP. So, and the special ed has an understanding of what information we gather and what does this mean, right? So all of these people have to be critical and part of it. And then, for our families, it's really important to have an interpreter. And this is a new, um, new caveat. It is important. So I'm a bilingual school psychologist, and I have, I'm very comfortable with the language of an IEP meeting. I can, I can say that thing, all those things pretty quickly. But if I'm reporting out on a, how a particular student is doing, I cannot have a, I should not, not that I cannot, but I should not have a dual role in that meeting because my view, my lens in that meeting is to talk and interpret and discuss findings as to why we may be recommending an IEP for a child. So if at all possible, you want to have an interpreter there as the voice. And that's a really important thing that, um, you know, even in 54, we've, we've developed over time because it's really critical. You're the voice. You, because also, uh, as some of us who have been in those meetings and, and have been interpreting, Families share things with you in the conversation, and then you turn to the person and they said, no. Well, no, there is a whole dialogue here. We need you to literally be the voice. They said this, this is how they, you know, just the, you're the voice, and that and there's a training that we do in our 54, in District 54, to talk about when you're interpreting in those conversations, what does that look like? So, so again, the special ed staff, the gen ed staff, and the bilingual staff are coming in and they're collaborating because not only, um, again, the gen ed teacher knows where they started day one, the bilingual teacher might have um, history with the child, but minimally they have from day one, and then the special ed, and what does this mean? And it's really important because we all have the end goal of getting that child to grade level or as close to grade level, right? Obviously, every entitlement has a different expectation of what grade level would look like. So when we're talking LD, when we're talking developmental delay, that's one perspective. If we're talking ASD, if we're talking um, an intellectual disability, that's a different, but we have an end goal, right? And so we wanna have an understanding and all those people and all those players have to be part of that process and in the development of 
that IEP. It is critical that each one has a voice. And Nancy and I have talked about this repeatedly over you know, preparing this presentation. Sometimes when we get to the evaluation process and we start opening domains, um, our EL bilingual staff kind of like take a back row. No, we need to bring them into the conversation. Or our SPED staff, oh no, this is an EL student, so they kind of get um, back burner, no. EL or bilingual does not, SPED does not trump EL bilingual, bilingual EL does not trump SPED. This is really critical. Students who are struggling, students are struggling. It just so happens that they speak a different language as well. So that's really critical too. And, then, and just to, to add to what um, Liz is saying as well, is that this is, you know, this is an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. This is something that you know, Liz and I have a relationship of having worked together, and it's something that's continuing to develop right across our district. Um, you know, we have 28 schools, so it's continuing to develop across each building and in different teams. Um, but again, the, as Liz was saying, the student is at the center, but we also want to make sure that all the voices are equal. And so when we think about that, um, that shows up then in the um, evaluation process of how does each person contribute. And it's critical to, to know that each one does have an important part, whether it's at the domain, at the evaluation, and or at the, um, at the IEP uh, drafting, right? Um, again, the EL Gen Ed have an idea of where they would be or what's the history for the child, and then uh, what information so I happen, to, I happen to have the luxury of being a bilingual certified trained psychologist. Not every psychologist have that, have that training. So it is critical to have an understanding of when do we test or when do we need to test bilingually if we're going to evaluate and what is that going to look like, right? Because student A, we might do a, for me, might do a Spanish evaluation completely. And student B, um, we might have a dual, so we're, we're breaking standardization and we have to have an understanding of what that looks like when we're breaking standardization to um, evaluate the student because you're using both languages. And that happens in communication as well as cognitive, right? Um, as well as the other areas. Um, and so, or are we going solely in English and why? But then even then you're breaking standardization because there's things that you, when standardized practices is there's a certain way you're supposed to administer this test and there's a certain way you ask a question and there's a certain answer that they give you. And the child who is in a simultaneous learning experience might offer you a slightly different, correct, but slightly different response and we need to know that and what to, what to do to accept that. So along with the, that collaboration of providing that information about the evaluation of how um, all of those uh, domains and how their current currently function, which we've talked about, then if a student is identified, then that collaboration continues. So that collaboration continues then when we're generating goals. So we want to have the EL bilingual multilingual staff, the gen ed staff, the special ed staff working together collaboratively to generate the goals for the student and to talk about how we're going to make this comprehensible for the family. And then also, again, as Liz mentioned, when we're providing services, that SPED does not trump EL. So if someone is a multilingual learner and they're identified for services, it doesn't mean, again, that here you go, it's yours, and now they no longer receive EL support. Um, so in our, in our district, one thing that works well is during, it might be uh, that, that uh, language support is provided during guided reading rotations. And just as a disclaimer, we have a push-in model, okay, for our um, EL support, just so that you know that. Um, so it might be during guided reading rotations, we have an after school program, targeted assistance, which really focuses on writing development. That's another way that services are, may be provided for a student who's duly identified. We also have a great benefit, and many of you may be experiencing this as well, where many of our special ed staff also have their uh, endorsement, right? They've gone through the training, they have a background in, in providing services for multilingual students, and so they're considered an E plus teacher. And so now they're able to uh, provide that support from, from two different perspectives. Um, and then again, we're just continuing having this conscious collaboration that we have between our departments. Yep. Wow, thank you, Liz and Nancy. What a great um, presentation and lots of really good information. So we're gonna move into our panel discussion next. And uh, we kind of pre-generated a lot of questions that typically come up that we hear from different coordinators and school districts. And we're going to try and address as many as, as we can. We are kind of short on time. 
Uh, but we did also put together some resources for you, and we will continue to add to those resources for you as we go. So the first question that we see very often, especially after today's presentation about state monitoring compliance and the disproportionality being a risk factor, we see that districts always ask, um, our district feels that we are over-identifying our multicultural, multilingual learners needing IEP services. What can we do to improve our screening and evaluation processes? Would anybody on the panel like to um, comment on that question? So one of the big things is just looking at your process, right? And one of the resources that I believe you, you are going to have a link to is just a process that we do, that, that my teams do from tier one all the way through. But look at your process, tweak your process, make sure that the EL multilingual staff is involved in that process and um, making it systematic. So it's black, that is black and white. You need to have this, you need to have quantitative as well as qualitative information. And it needs to be comprehensible to everybody, right? Don't just hand a whole bunch of worksheets to someone and say they're struggling. No, what does this mean? The next question is, what are best practices for providing interpretation and translation services to families of multilingual learners? We actually have, ISBE has a guidance um, document that many of you may have already seen. And because we're short on time, I'm gonna skip over this one, but we will make sure that that resource is included in, um, in the, uh, the document that we will be sharing with you. The next question is, are multilingual learners with IEPs are not receiving direct ESL or bilingual support? How can we meet both the English learner and SPED needs for our students? Would anybody on the panel like to answer? So I guess I'm gonna go back to what we were just presenting. It is critical, it is critical that all stakeholders, in this case the EL representative, the Gen Ed representative, and the special ed representative come in and collaborate because the Gen Ed knows where they need to be by the end of the year. The SPED knows what a typical, let's say, spe uh, special needs student um, and their development. And then the EL comes in with that perspective of language proficiency and, and, and again, and so those three individuals have to be collaborating at a constant uh, conversation. We have collaborative meetings they, where they plan and problem solve um, and it helps to facilitate that. Who's gonna take this role and when? Did anybody else on the panel care to comment? We're gonna move on. How can we support EL and SPED teams in improving collaboration practices? So one thing I think about, and I'm thinking about the, the video, right, where it takes one person, right? It takes one person, um, we, that's how it grew in, in our district, right? We have one person, it's often uh, been the, um, one of the special education teachers who says, you know what, Nancy, I was at this building we were talking about this student and I learned that this student is a multilingual student. I'm wondering if you're aware of this student and would you come and join us for our meeting? Right, so one person inviting another person to come, right? Taking that risk of saying, come join me and look at, let's talk about this student together. And then as that starts to happen, someone else hears about it. They talk about it. The sped ed teachers talk about it with each other and say, well, I invited Nancy to come or I invited Katie to come or I invited Rosie to come. Oh, that's something we can do, right? And by word of mouth, it spreads, and then we start to do that. Or if in our um, multilingual team meetings or PLC meeting, which is where we have the gen ed and all the teachers together talking about a student and saying, you know what, this student, we have some other concerns. Let's, get, let's invite the, the SPED coach to come or the teacher to come. Let's get these people. And so that being brave and taking that first step of, of taking a little risk and asking somebody else to come alongside you is, is kind of what gets that collaborative process going. I don't know if anybody has anything else to, to add. Um, actually, the, our District uh, 54 colleagues are very generous. They've very generously shared some resources with us. So we do want to get to that, um, to that piece. Um, so um, linked to this uh, slide here are the questions that we received from the field but after we'd already prepared the presentation. So um, what we thought, okay, we wanna make sure we're addressing. So we hope that as we look through many of them, we've addressed a lot of the questions that are in there, but also, um, again, uh, very generously, um, Lydia from ISBE, our, our colleague, has 
also offered, if you look on the slide, to um, offer you, um, if anybody wants to make uh, an appointment with her for tomorrow or Friday, to ask some of the, answer some of the co compliance questions that she is willing to do that. And we also discussed uh, a future, uh, like a Zoom meeting, where she would address some of those compliance questions very specifically and open it up um, to the field. So thank you, Lydia, for, for offering that. But as we go through these, um, uh, these questions, the other piece is that um, uh, my colleague Adelicia and I decided um, to make a project of it and to really look for resources. So when you make a copy of this, you know, you, it is a, a, um, a, you know, a, your own copy of these questions. But we ask you that as you go forward, you know, maybe give us until like the end of November maybe. Um, and if you go back to this document, to this, this particular slide and you download a copy of it, hopefully there'll be some uh, more resources linked right to this document. And then once we feel like it's, you know, publishable, we can talk with ISBE or at the IRC website to, um, to really organize them, you know, compliance, you know, and as well as very specific questions. Because there were some on early childhood, there were some on um, transition to adult, you know, for secondary students. So very spe specialized questions. And uh, Ad Adelicia and I would like to spend a little time on kind of organizing that. The, the other piece is if you look in the uh, notes page, well, so I think on, on the end of this one, I'm not sure. Yeah, at the end of the your slides, you have some resources. Um, and, and it's also on the end of the, the notes page. So if you click here, uh, Lydia has very generously linked a PDF of uh, uh, slides that answer some of the compliance questions, but it's really concentrated in that, um, as well as um, directly to the uh, ISBE um, I resource page for bilingual special education. And then um, w uh, our colleague Nancy shared about the, the work uh, my colleagues, um, Elsie Hamayan, Barb Marler, myself, and Jack D'Amico um, did uh, we're actually working, uh, we, we finished the third edition of that book, but another colleague of mine, Teresa Young, was a speech language pathologist, uh, and I developed the seven factors template. So you're welcome, again, you can make a copy of it for gathering what I, I really was great to hear Nancy talk about um, and Liz, that before they even come to that meeting, um, the teams have really organized that qualitative data, the context for the conversation, and then they put that quantitative data on top of it. So that's free for you to just make a copy of it if it helps. There's a list here of books. That's another resource that's in here. So when you link, these are the latest editions of these uh, books um, around differentiating uh, literacy. This is a third edition just out. Uh, Joanne Parody, Martha Crago, and Fred Genesee on dual language development and disorders. So these are all linked. This is uh, one about uh, literacy. And this is one about disproportional representation of minorities. Um, our colleagues, uh, Kathy Scamilla, working on instruction, but also assessment. That's a uh, dual assessment. Um, our colleague, Margaret Gottlieb, just did a book on um, classroom assessment and multiple languages. And she also has a very small book on a from ASCD um, that really takes you on a kind of assessment tour of our experience of one child through the whole year and all the sorts of things that you can gather. It's a small book, but really powerful. Um, and then this, these are two books that my colleagues and I have worked on. You know, this is the one around sort of MTSS process. And then the recent book on uh, classroom-based research for children, those children who are already identified as having special education needs. Um, so that's, um, that's there. And then, again, as I mentioned, our colleagues from District 54 so generously have linked two documents, um, a problem-solving process document for you to use that really walks you through the, the process and what is expected, kind of. You know, everyone knows this process, so you're welcome to have that. And then also another document which is uh, a checklist that they use as well. And um, again, whenever you use it, or uh, I'm sure they would love to hear how you use it and your adaptations and sort of uh, implementation and how you've changed things uh, for you. And they've included their names and you have our emails. So if you wanna share with them <laughs> about what, um, what you've learned and how you've sort of changed and adapted their, their resources. 
And uh, so we are, oops, I, I, we should have a slide. Thank you. <laughs> so um, we, we uh, finished our time, and we, we'd like to thank you so much for your attention. And uh, we're, I think we're happy to stay for another, like, eight minutes if anybody has any other questions. Otherwise, please stay in touch and revisit this PDF regularly to see if there are any updates of those original documents. But I'd like first to thank our, our colleagues here and the panel, and thank you for your time. So if there are any questions. Um, can just go to the mic, right? Yeah, we can just cut, yeah. Oh, there's a, there should be a mic up. It's in the middle aisle. It is oh, oh there's, a, there's a mic in the middle aisle. So if anybody has a question, um, or if you just want to relax, you can do that too. <laughs> Back to that first slide that has the QR code. Oh, yeah. 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 So, we're, yeah, thank you. That's a really great idea. Hierarchy of needs, right? I can't do it. Um, I hear you. I can't do it other than that because of it. So, yeah, just remember, make sure you. Oh, they took us off. So, we're trying to do that. Yeah. Sure. If it's complex.